تو من سر تو من بنار And are you able to admit them, Trish? They're already in. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we've got a few more people that were waiting to join, so um, we'll give them a couple more minutes before we kick off. But thank you for coming along today um, and for, yeah, coming so we can share some information about Asset AI and where it's up to. Um, we've done a few of these webinars or, or um, you know, community-facing sessions over the last 12 months or so, but uh, it's always good to keep people abreast of the changes on the project, and it's one of these things that, evolves fairly quickly and changes, um, I won't say day to day, but, uh, you know, AI is emerging and rapidly evolving. So we're doing our best to keep ahead of that and to, um, you know, build some of those uh, innovations into this platform as well. Give them one more minute. Uh, just by way of introduction, for those who don't know me, uh, Josh Debert, I'm the Chief Engineer at IPWA New South Wales and ACT. Um, I've been involved with Asset AI for, well, since I started with the Institute, so about two and a half years now. It was uh, initially commenced by my predecessor, Arian Renson, in the role, um, but certainly I've been involved with a lot of the development and, and work that's been going on, um, you know, into the platform. And then um, we've also got Nick Habit here who um, is working on the project. And Nick, might, you might give a brief intro to yourself. Thanks, Josh. Uh, I am the project manager for Asset AI with IPWA and work with the main role there is to work with the development team, Transport for New South Wales, and the interaction with councils on the project. I've been involved for about uh, 15 months now. Thanks, Nick. Uh, and look, just in the way of housekeeping, uh, this session's been set up as a uh, like a town hall type session, so um, only presenters will be able to have their cameras on. We do have a QA and a function that you should be able to see uh, down at the bottom uh, of the screen. So if you do have any questions as we're going throughout this webinar, please put them in the Q&A. There is a chat function as well. Uh, we'll try and keep an eye on both the chat and the Q&A, but if you could please put your questions uh, in the Q&A and then we'll address those either throughout the presentation or uh, we've set aside 15 minutes towards the end. Um, look, I might get started. I'll share my screen uh, and we'll, we'll get into this uh, session. Okay, well, look, thanks to everyone for coming along today. Uh, this is the first of our new monthly webinar series that the Roads and Transport Director will be doing. We've identified that, um, you know, we've got a fair bit that we're working on. We try to keep people abreast of all of the projects that we've got going on, but we thought this is a good way to do a bit more of a deeper dive into some of those activities and, um, you yeah, know, give people a chance to sort of see what we're doing, but also to provide some, some commentary on that. And, um, you know, we're very appreciative of uh, the strong support of our members and always... Glad to hear um, hear feedback from you as well. Um, I would note as well that we are recording this session. So yeah, if something comes up today that you want to look at later on or you want to share this with one of your colleagues who couldn't make it, uh, we will make the recording of this session available uh, after today. So just in regards to the agenda for today's session, uh, I'll give a bit of a background to the project uh, and an overview of where we're up to. Um, then uh, Nick will go into a bit more of the detail as to what the platform is and, and how it functions. Uh, we'll touch on the machine learning development, which is 
one of the newer innovations that's come in to this platform and that we're very excited about. I mean, this is sort of one of the whole reasons for commencing this project in the beginning was to sort of um, harness the benefits that machine learning can, can uh, bring. Uh, and the first, um, um, you know, feature around that is the defect susceptibility index, which we will go into in a bit more detail, and then we'll cover future plans, both in the machine learning space, but also at a broad uh, platform overview and also the rollout of that um, across the state. So in terms of the uh, the background of the, um, the, 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 the platform or the, you know, I guess the need for the platform, um, as you're probably all aware, there's uh, certainly some deficiencies with the way that uh, the local road network is managed in New South Wales at the moment. Um, the uh, biannual uh, road asset benchmarking project is very good at capturing that. The, the shortfall from the last report, which was released uh, last year, was um, about $680 million per annum. So um, that sort of highlights to us that there is a need for councils in particular to operate more um, efficiently. And we see uh, innovations like asset AI as a mechanism to enable more efficient operation or more efficient, you know, approach for a proactive approach as it were to defect management. Um, we're also conscious that there's a lot of people who are using, I guess, older ways of doing things. So they might be doing manual inspections or they might be sort of relying on those, um, you know, longer term surveys that are done every four to five years. Uh, and don't necessarily have uh, up-to-date visibility of their the condition of their road network. So we sort of see this as a as a mechanism to enable that as well. Uh, and obviously, you know, the, the change in climate and and the risks associated with that is having a significant impact on the rate of deterioration as well. So that's really where um, asset AI, uh, you know, the backbone behind that. You know, I think we've got a video now which I'll just play, and hopefully the sound's going to work in your head. Asset AI is a, a multi-phase solution. Uh, there's effectively three stages to, um, to how it works. The first one is passive data collection. We have cameras on vehicles that are already on the road network. Those cameras actually scan the road. They pick up all the defects that they see, so be it a pothole or overhanging tree branches, uh, things like that. We then take that data, bring it into our platform where we uh, normalise the data we then present it out to councils and the other organisations who are using it to identify where they should be sending their maintenance crews out to the network and um, which defects they, they need to be approaching. Asset AI uses a combination of artificial intelligence and machine learning to capture road defects in real time. It really has the potential to revolutionise road asset maintenance. We can start using that wealth of data to better plan our maintenance, to be quicker if there is a defect, to address the defect, and in the end, make sure that public money delivers more value to the community. Opportunities for SAT AI in road maintenance are basically endless. It's more than just a step forward, it's a leap forward. This solution is designed for councils in particular and other road um, management agencies. So we wanted to make sure that it was user-friendly, uh, designed to be used by people who are out in the field. It was also important that we considered the context both in a metro setting but also uh, in regional communities. Our roads maintenance team are really benefiting from the use of asset AI. It's allowing them to respond to pothole issues in the road much more quickly. Once the AI detects the potholes, the job is sent directly to our pothole repair truck and they go out and repair the pothole within the next two or three days. So that's really increased our response times and reduced the need on our community to report these defects to us. The artificial intelligence will tell you what type of defect there might be on the road. So that'll be anything from defective line marking, litter on the roads, it might be cracking, it might be some surface defects. But this thing's smart enough, it can tell the difference between roadkill and litter. Um, it can start to tell you if there's branches hanging over the road. One of the surprising things that we learned was it actually finds the graffiti on the side of the roads um, as well. So the artificial intelligence will pick up everything. 
What we can see with the use of Asset AI is that we'll be picking up all of the defects as you're going past and we'll, we'll start to see an efficiency and also a time saving. And certainly in Griffith, in the urban network, we've noticed that with the uh, street sweeper going around the town. So I think what we're seeing is an opportunity for us to um, uh, look at the new technology, look at the old ways we've done things and see how we can work smarter but not necessarily harder. All right, well, look, that was a video that uh, Transport for New South Wales put together uh, about the project. I think it gives a really good overview of, you know, what we're trying to do here and also some insight into uh, the capabilities of the platform. Uh, we'll go and do that in a, in a bit more detail now. Um, I'll just briefly touch on the project partners who are involved, and then I'll hand over to Nick, who will cover um, some more of the detail about the, the technical background as to how it all works. So you can see there on the screen, these are all the organisations that are currently involved, uh, in, at least in a fairly um, meaningful way with the project. Um, obviously, Transport and ourselves are the, the main two uh, organisations who are driving this, but I certainly acknowledge that Canterbury Banks Town City Council uh, was where the original genesis for this idea came from, and they've been um, you know, a foundational council partner from day one. Uh, Griffith came on board a little over 12 months ago uh, and we've just recently onboarded uh, a number of other councils who you can see on the screen there. I have preempted Blacktown. They're sort of going through the process of being onboarded. They're not quite on board yet, but we do have a pipeline of uh, another two or three councils that we're working with to get them onto the platform uh, as well. Uh, Deloitte are the development partner, so they're doing all of the uh, the coding and the um, you know, IT uh, development. And then we have a number of data collection providers that we've been working with as well. But I will hand over to Nick now. Thank you, Josh. Um, so a little bit about how the platform gets the data from out in the field into the computer. So the initial stage obviously is the data collection and that can be collected from a number of ways. The computer vision data, like you saw in that demonstration before, currently we've got a couple of partners there, which is uh, the Retina Vision and Visala cameras. They can be attached to basically any vehicle that's in the field and can be doing passive data collection or a targeted inspection. We've also partnered through Transport for New South Wales uh, Comp Compass I IoT, uh, which provide us uh, sensor data from private vehicles. Uh, it's fully privatised, so you can't see whose the vehicles are, but it shows the uh, road condition as the uh, motorist uh, sees it, and that creates a uh, road quality score, which I'll show you later. And the Cisco routers is another way of doing that on the uh, public buses is what Transport's trying to um, explore that uh, further option. Once that data comes through the system and gets into our platform, we deduplicate it. So that basically looks at the location of the defects, uh, common defects, uh, classic like cracking, if you can picture longitudinal cracking or block cracking, the camera is pretty good at picking up multiple copies of that. Our process then uh, groups all those together so you, it's an easier user experience to uh, see it and you don't end up with uh, um, too many defects. We also uh, use the IPWA maintenance guide for uh, standardising the defects. Uh, and what we found recently is uh, the system will identify any defect. Uh, most councils normally only identify a defect as something that needs to be responded to. So through this process, we see there's a lot more defects that you get to see than what you actually need to respond to from a reactive maintenance perspective. And um, that, that helps with long-term planning. And then to be able to see this data, we've got a uh, Asset AI map viewer, which we'll give a demonstration of shortly. And there's also, uh, with Canary Bankstown, we've integrated a system, a bespoke system into their platform of the way they uh, do their workflows. Uh, longer term, we're looking at APIs to be, an output API to be able to integrate into councils, um, systems or other ways of connecting. Uh, so a little bit more about the data sets. There's three key types of data that we see for collection. The one in the middle for the uh, video recording and uh, detection system is the computer vision data. That seems to be the uh, 
quickest way of collecting uh, data. It sits in about the middle of the accuracy range. And um, that's what you see the majority of the images from. We're, and then the non-visual non data is the sensor data that we're talking about from the private vehicles. You can get a fairly wide range um, coverage, but the accuracy is fairly low on that uh, information because you have no control over the calibration of those uh, devices. And then LiDAR is probably the most uh, accurate data, but also much more expensive and a lot harder to analyze. So that's something that we're looking at uh, bringing into the platform in the future. Uh, but at this stage, that's um, not here yet. So just an idea of how, how the different data sets can, can be integrated. So the data normalization, this is the uh, IPWEA road inspection manual that we've based it off. The, it's a risk-based approach that looks at the type of defect, the severity of the defect, the road hierarchy, and it creates a score. And then in the system, that score is then converted to response time. So a, def, uh, a level three defect on a arterial road will have a shorter response time than a defect, uh, a level three defect on a local access road based on the road hierarchy. Uh, it also is trying to standardize all of those defect um, response times across the state. So we're trying to keep a consistent approach so that uh, Hopefully, long term, we uh, doesn't matter which road road network you're working on, you can uh, understand this. The response times are fairly consistent, and this core is based off the Transport for New South Wales M3 specification. So the cat classifications and responses are all trying to align with what uh, the highways work on, as well as uh, local roads. So it's a fairly um, wide scale. So we'll stop sharing the screen there and we'll see how the uh, change your share screen works. And we'll <laughs> see whether we can uh, give you a demonstration. Nothing like a live demonstration on a stream to see whether it works or not. So on the assumption I've done things correctly, Did we can see the uh, we can see the intro screen, Nick, not not the uh, the viewer. Yep, that's yep. right. Yep. So this is the intro screen for Asset AI. So when you log on to the portal, this will be the first thing that you see. Um, the first step is that there's a few. Um, uh, the, this data set that you can see here is the entire data set of what's currently in the platform. When you log into it as a council, you'll see your own particular council, but you won't see everyone else's. Um, I like bringing this screen here up. I'm not sure, Josh, tell me if that's viewable there. Yep. The different mm -hmm. defects. Yep. So this just gives you a quick summary of the different uh, defect types and the number of times that these things have been de uh, detected that are currently live on the system. Um, and you can see cracking. There's 18,000 um, responses on cracking. Uh, wearing surface, which is basically flushing type defects, there's 13,000. Uh, and longitudinal line marking. So you can see a lot of line marking uh, detections. They're basically the, the main things that it, um, it, it finds a large amount. But then when you start looking at uh, potholes, there's 3,000 um, potholes uh, on the system at the moment. It goes right down to roadkill, um, graffiti, edge break. So you can get a fair array of different types of um, defects. And I find that as a quick guide, quite useful to um, see what people can see. Um, when you jump into the platform, as I said, I can see all the councils that we've got logged in at the moment. So we've got um, regional councils. We've also got a lot of metro councils. Uh, at the moment, we've got uh, this view here. I've got 82,000 defects. First thing uh, most road authorities say to me is I don't want to see that many defects. Uh, but with some fil uh, filtering processes, you can uh, filter that out quite quickly. So if we... Um, pick up uh, on our old faithful uh, potholes and um, we filter that back down to the severity types of just three, fours and fives. So we're not interested in the potholes that are 50 mil in diameter. We're looking in the bad ones. Um, our, our defects now are two, 200 
uh, 70 defects, and you can see they're still scattered all over the state. Um, just quickly, I'm not sure how well my uh, internet is going to work on that, but you can quickly click on a defect. You can see it's a severity five. You can view the picture and you can identify that that's, um, that's a defect that uh, is a problem and uh, needs to be responded to. And uh, those sorts of things can get assigned to work crews pretty quickly. Uh, you can see that um, we've got some uh, details about the defects. Uh, how many times it's been detected, the uh, severity. It also gives you the road quality score, uh, which I'll jump across to in a moment. Uh, and then you've got an ability to put some comments and things in there. Um, so this automatically picks it up. Uh, we've got a triaging process where the if the defect's identified and then the, road, the inspections continue to happen on that road, uh, and their cameras don't detect it, it'll automatically uh, retire the defects. So your data is continually changing on the platform. And the idea there is that you're seeing current data and things are automatically um, updating for you. Um, I can show you a thousand other defects like that, but I'm just conscious, um, well, I'll give you a couple more. The other one I found quite fascinating was um, Guideposts. A lot of people say, what does difference does guideposts make? But um, from a safety perspective, they're still fairly important um, assets to keep live in the network. And when we roll it out, there's, there's 2,000 guideposts that are uh, defective on the network. So again, we'll pick on Bell's Line of Road. Can zoom in. And you can select the defect. And you can see there that we've got a guidepost that's squashed. Now, at the end of the day, from a customer service perspective, if you drive past that every day and see that the council's not fixing simple things like that, it becomes frustrating. And um, you get a lot of complaints on simple tasks like that. And just by removing that and having that as a routine activity that's fixed, really enhances the way the road network works. And uh, I, I believe it improves the community satisfaction on the road network. Um, so that's just a couple of examples. There's a range of different filters here that you can uh, filter out based on road hierarchy, um, the severity. Uh, you can do it in asset type. So if you just want to filter down to just the uh, just pavement group and just have a look at how many uh, defects uh, there are in pavements, uh, it's a pretty straightforward process to filter it out. There's 40, uh, 46,000 defects in the pavements. Um, for the data analy analytic type people, you can also jump across to the data explorer and you can search using uh, a bit more search options and it gives you the spreadsheet. You can flick between the two. Uh, you can have that data just expressed in the uh, in the in the map interface. And at any stage, whatever filter that you've got working, you can uh, export to CSV or you can export to other GIS platforms. So, um, and if you're looking for a more detailed presentation, we're sure happy to talk to councils um, in a bit more detail. But the other thing you've got is a few different ways, uh, layers so that we've got in the system. We've got the transport for New South Wales uh, road segmentation, which looks at road hierarchy, uh, uh, speed, and surface type. We've got uh, points of interest, so you can turn on where all the schools are and hospitals and things like that. You can also import uh, layers. So you can upload um, CSVs or KML files of particular data sets. If you want to know where all your bridges are in relation to the defects, you can upload those points and things like that. It's fairly uh, interactive and powerful on that. The other thing we've got is the road quality data. So I'll turn that layer on there and it gives you the uh, choice of the, uh, the current situation and, and things that are changing. And you'll see that all the roads start turning uh, into colours on me. And this goes across the whole of New South Wales, not just the councils that we're currently working on. And this data comes from Compass IoT and is from the experience of the road user. Uh, basically, it 
looks at the uses the gyroscopes in private vehicles that are about the last seven or eight years old and just looks at how those the tires are performing on the road and gives us an indication of the roughness of the road generally cons the experience we've seen is it's uh, shows a better result on the road network than what probably is in the road. And that comes down to the fact that uh, most public drive, uh, choose the best line to drive and don't always drive through all our potholes, but it gives us a good indication. And the idea of this is a, an early intervention. So we can, again, filter this down to uh, different data sets. So we can look at um, the moderate and poor condition roads and you'll find a lot of green roads will disappear on my screen. And um, we can then click on a segment of road. And that's showing that it's got a score of uh, four and that's in that moderate range. So this, this range is set up very similar to the IRI roughness condition index for those uh, asset engineers out there. And you can see that this road uh, has got a six week rolling average and uh, this data will just sit here and show us the last six weeks all the time. And you can see that it's it's moderate. So it's it's rough, but it's not catastrophic, basically, is how I would describe that. And the other thing we can look at is what's deteriorating. So this is where in the last six weeks, a road has uh, deteriorated in the quality. So we've gotten a result at one, at, at one point and the second point it's changed. And this is a nice example here. Six weeks ago, the score was uh, three. It's reporting a better result. So maybe some potholes were fixed. Maybe the, the drivers drove in a better line, but then it spiked again. And now it's sitting at a four. So um, from that, I would suggest um, it's worth looking at and doing some more investigation. And that's the idea of this data, is just from a desktop being able to do a quick analysis of the network and uh, see, see where the areas need to be uh, investigated. Uh, Josh, is there time for any more things to look at or would you like to press on? Yeah, I think we might press on. There is a question here um, from Paul just saying, uh, how wide does the camera pick up defects? For example, will I need to have to travel down both lanes of road or will it pick up two lanes heading in one direction? And so the cameras have a fairly wide range. It's basically, um, if you, at the, the, the camera is, an, is a phone. So if you look at getting your phone and sticking it on the dash and having a look at what it can see, you can uh, see that. A good example is um, there's a section in Sydney where there's a, uh, I don't know my roads in Sydney, but there's a sound wall that's probably about 10 metres off the travel lane that's got graffiti on it and it picks it up really well. Um, so what it, what it, what's in its line of sight it can see, uh, but um, when there's a lot of traffic, so if you've got a four-lane highway, it can't see underneath the cars is probably the more challenging factor. But at the moment, Canberra Bankstown are using street sweepers which go to one side of the road and are collecting uh, collecting good data around the travel lanes. Yep. Thanks, Nick. There's also another question that Bill Wilcox just posted. Is asset AI being used or will it be used on the state highway network? Uh, which is maybe preempting something that we will cover later in the presentation. So. Fair enough. Um, so we will answer your question, Bill. Um, so, Nick, I might get you to stop sharing and I'll jump back to the slide deck. Thank you. I'll also turn my camera back on. All right, thanks, Nick. So look, um, that's just a, a very brief intro, as Nick said, to the, the platform itself. Um, we're more than happy to sort of have one-on-one -on -one conversations with councils uh, who, who want to have a look at this in more detail. Um, some of the benefits as we see them to the use of this platform, I think we've touched on most of these already, but just to sort of reinforce the points, um, having this, this data, picked up by vehicles that are already on the network improves efficiencies and, and obviously the data itself helps you make more informed decisions about where you should be undertaking your maintenance activities. Um, the advantage, I mean, what we sort of suggest is that you put it on vehicles that are already out there. So if you can get it on your garbage trucks or your street sweepers, they're doing the rounds anyway. 
And so they can sort of be doing this passive data collection at the same time. Um, the flow and benefit of that, of course, is you're getting data on a regular basis. So once a week or once a fortnight, uh, and that allows you to sort of see the trends over time. And I think that's quite powerful as well. Um, as much as possible, we're trying to standardise the processes, um, both between councils themselves, but also with the state government agencies. Um, we are also having conversations at a national level because we can see the potential of this platform to maybe scale outside of New South Wales. So we're having chats with um, people like Austros to sort of say, well, how would we, how would we adopt this if we were going to do it at a national level as well? Um, and I guess the overall writing, uh, you know, aim or one of the overriding aims here is to improve the safety of the network. So improve the safety both from a data collection perspective, but also from um, an intervention perspective, which should make it safer for motorists and other road users that are out there. So the current sort of status of the project, as I alluded to, um, this you know this development cycle, if you like, started uh, a little over a year ago. So that was in April 23. Uh, we've completed the first two phases of this project, uh, which is sort of building the base baseline, um, you know, functionality and sort of building in some some basic features there. Uh, we're now into phase three, which commenced last month, uh, which is really looking at the machine learning side of things and also scaling out to additional councils. So we've said there council expansion nine in total. So that's nine who have either come on board or who have signed MOUs and will be coming on board in the next few months. Um, we're obviously looking at tweaking features. We've got a working group with reps from all of those councils involved to give us feedback from the user perspective because we're very conscious that we want to be designing things and building things that, that work for the users themselves. Um, and obviously the machine learning is a big focus for us uh, at the moment. Um, we're, we're going to talk about the D, DSI uh, in a moment, so it'll give you a bit of an insight into the first cab off the rank from a machine learning perspective. Uh, and we, are, we have plans to expand to around 15 councils by the end of the current financial year, uh, noting that there is certainly scope that if we have interest beyond those 15 with councils to come on board as well, but it will likely be, um, there'll be a cost involved uh, for that. You know, we, we we have funds from a trial perspective to the end of uh, the current financial year, but moving forward from them, we're, we're going to have to look at a, a subscription-based model for access to the to the platform. Um, and we're also looking at, uh, we, have, we have a tender out at the moment through Transport for New South Wales for additional camera providers. So Nick mentioned the two that we're using at the moment, uh, and we've, we've identified that there are other providers in the market that we think want to come into this platform. So we've done a uh, an open tender and we've got um, a panel contract that will be coming out of that to um, provide some other options. And that, that'll sort of give councils who want to come onto this platform some, um, you know, we'll have vetted them for you so you don't need to sort of go through the full procurement cycle uh, to bring those guys onto the platform. So I will very briefly touch on the machine learning and then I'll hand back over to Nick uh, to go through this in a little bit more detail. But um, in short, machine learning was was always the plan uh, for Asset AI. I mean, the AI is an inherent part of what we're trying to do here. Uh, and machine learning is is obviously one of the main uh, areas of, of um, AI that's in use throughout the world. Um, and we've sort of broken it down into, uh, I guess, four different categorizations or, or use cases for it. So looking at, you know, how could you use it for your, your road management? How could you use it for maybe longer term asset management as well, the management of defects and, and sort of other, other uh, elements there. So when we sort of unpack this, we realised there is a hell of a lot that you could do with the data. Um, and yeah, whilst we would love to do all of these things, that's probably not going to happen. So we've had to come up with a, a bit of a prioritisation. And that's what's led us to um, picking one, one item in particular. Um, but Nick, I might pass over to you to sort of look at, I guess, the selection criteria yep. and sort of take us through from here. Yeah, so machine learning proved to be a very um, broad question and how long is a piece of string? Where do you want to start was the hard part. Asset AI is geared around, uh, like its vision, its focus is, at this stage is about a maintenance management response, trying to improve the data available to road authorities to make decisions about how to do maintenance as opposed to long-term asset management. So that was one of the key focuses on how we can build a machine learning uh, process to enhance that. Uh, and we wanted to try and achieve something that uh, in the short term gave benefit to councils 
uh, and then gave us an ability to scale that item to broaden uh, the continue to grow. So machine learning, as I've learned over the last uh, couple of months, I've had a, uh, a quick lesson in machine learning 101, which I'm not going to bore everyone with today, but it is a fairly complex process and requires a lot of different data sets and needs. Uh, if we're going to try and scale this across anywhere in New South Wales, instead of saying it's only a metro thing or it's only a rural thing, we needed to make sure that the machine learning capability had vision of those features across everywhere. So for argument's sake, if we got a, a feed from Hunter Water for all their utilities, that's great for Hunter, but doesn't really help us build a machine that's useful to the whole of New South Wales. Um, so that's part of the decision-making in, in what sort of data we can use and making sure that the features uh, try and um, enhance what you're looking at on our screen. Like as we saw, we've got 80,000 defects. How do we prioritize those? Which ones mean the most from a maintenance perspective? Uh, became a really important factor there. And also we've got funding for uh, phase one, which is looking at the development of machine learning we want to make sure we've got a product at the end of that that is actually usable. So we don't want to do a scattergun approach and end up with uh, trying to make multiple things work and then having nothing built at the end of the first phase because that doesn't help any of our uh, any of our councils. So there's sort sort of the uh, the approach that we, we we looked at in in why we we picked certain categories. Um, if we jump over to the next slide, Josh. Um, I'll give a bit more detail about what we ended up settling on. Um, and it's a defect set susceptibility index is the uh, is the words that we've come up with. Hopefully we can find a shorter uh, statement. <laughs> uh, but the D DSI. Um, so what is it? Um, the idea is to find to develop an index that uh, looks at the susceptibility of a road segment being um, about 100 metres long in absolute longest length, uh, could be even shorter than that. How, how susceptible it, is that to particular uh, defects, uh, focusing on pavement defects? And then looking at scaling that in future generations. The initial pay, pavement defects uh, that we're looking at is predominantly around that cracking and potholes. Um, cracking being one of the biggest things that the system detects makes it quite an attractive one to trial it on. And also the fact that, as we all know, most pavement failures start with cracking. So if you don't teach the machine what cracking does, then teaching it what a pothole is or a rut or a shove doesn't really help because the first thing that happens to a pavement in its failure, when it starts to fail it, it is some sort of cracking. Um, so we looked at pa uh, looking at cracking, we're looking at uh, potholing uh, as two separate um, impacts, and then we're also looking at the rut ruts and shoves as a as a third uh, thing. And then hopefully by the end of it, we'll be able to bring all that together, and we'll be able to say, okay, this segment, based on all these different inputs, and I'll get to the array of different inputs that we've got later. Um, has the potential of uh, is this highly susceptible? Is low susceptibility to that pay, uh, to those uh, defects? And then by understanding where that higher risk sits or susceptibility sits, hopefully that can inform the road authority to say, okay, it's worth investing uh, resources and money into fixing these defects, even though that's not the squeaky wheel, because it's going to save so much money in the long term. And that's really the real the real objective here is to try and give tools to the road authority to be able to make decisions um, for early intervention. Um, so as a um, as a trial or a prototype, there was some ideas about how we present this data, and obviously there'll be data that will be presented in Excel spreadsheets, but. Mapping interfaces is the one that seems to be the uh, easiest way these days to present it. And we're looking at having a scale color coding system 
of the scoring. So you have a low susceptibility and a high susceptibility, uh, and it'll just be a heat map basically of showing you where that where they are. You'll also be able to overlay your computer vision uh, data or your sensor data that we showed you earlier. So all of this will be interactive in, in maps. Uh, and the fun bit now, the data sets. <laughs> How many bits of data do you think we need to uh, make a machine uh, think like a human? It uh, turns out there's a lot. Um, what we've tried to look for is data sets that are available across the whole of New South Wales or even the whole of Australia. And uh, whether, for example, um, we're extracting data out of the bomb to point data on segments and giving the, the machine data for the last six months worth of weather conditions. So it can make um, decisions about what's happening to that pavement. It can learn about that pavement based on the last six months worth of, worth of, worth of data. Um, I've never seen anything that's done that sort of stuff before. Um, topography is trying to give us an idea of uh, what sort of terrain the road's working in and, uh, you know, hilly country um, versus flat country behaves differently. Uh, land use was an interesting topic. We're still growing that, that space. Um, and it leads into a question about traffic and Everyone looks at me and says, why, why does land use connect to traffic? But when you look at the traffic data set, we've got heavy vehicles obviously destroy most of our roads. We all know that, but we don't have very good data on heavy vehicles across the entire road network. We've got an idea, but they're actually linked to land use. The cropping country obviously ge generates a lot of... Um, uh, heavy vehicles, freight areas. So we can actually ask the question differently with a different data set to understand what what's happening in those spaces. Um, the uh, proximity to key infrastructure, um, soil classifications, and then we're starting to get into some uh, different uh, miscellaneous groups because we're not sure where to put them with um, the moisture, tree data, pavement temperature, simple things like trees. We all know that if the road's in a shady area, it's going to be uh, hold the moisture for longer and run the risk of potholes more. We're trying to work out that on a larger scale. Uh, we're trying to get the crash data in there and that will help us respond to things. It won't, won't be the cause of the defects, but it will help us respond. So that's just trying to give you an idea of how many different data sets we're currently looking at. And that list is growing. And what the process is, is we throw all of that at the wall, basically, and see which bits stick, uh, which bits actually make an impact on how the machine thinks about um, the way, the, how susceptible the segments are to uh, defects. Uh, so that's a very broad overview, but you'll see more to come on machine learning over the next little while. Uh, and it's a space that uh, is ever evolving. Thanks, Nick. Um, so just by way of, uh, I guess, some future or some insight into sort of the, the future plans as to where we see um, this, this platform going, um, it, certainly we've, we've identified that we want to have more councils on board. So that's one of the, the you know key drivers for us is to keep getting more and more users into this. Um, back to Bill's question around the state road network, um, this, the short answer is, is yes. So we've got the um i forget the name of them but the the, the metro based um maintenance side of transport for new south wales those who sort of qa the work that's done by contractors on the the state roads in in the sydney area um are using asset ai uh, we're also in discussions with some of the rmcc uh you know coordinators across the state as well to see if we can sort of marry up some yeah usage cases there as well so you know, there's a lot of interest being generated by this platform within Transport for New South Wales. It's taken them a little bit of time to get across it and the the, the message is still getting out there, but they're, they're coming back in, in some pretty strong ways. So we sort of envisage that, you know, in a couple of years' time, we would have quite a few councils on board, but also quite a few Transport for New South Wales users on board, which, again, 
opens up lots of interesting use cases around how the data is collected and then shared between users and, and this sort of thing because again our driver here is efficiency so if a council vehicle happens to stray on the straight road network and picks up some defects there well why not share that data with the, the road manager that's that's using it and vice versa if the state road um, you know vehicles have detected defects on the local road because they have to detour down a local road why not share that with with the council um it does open up a lot of questions around data sharing privacy and legalities which we still need to work through but we can see the potential of the platform to um to you know be more efficient in that space um i've alluded to that we will um have to transition at some point to a, a you know a paid use model this is a trial at the moment we've got funding through transport predominantly until the end of this financial year um, that's not going to last forever, so we'll eventually have to move to a subscription-based model. Uh, we're likely to see that kick off uh, at the beginning of the next financial year. Uh, and then we've also identified um, lots of future features. This is not this is excluding the other machine learning components that we've already identified, and um, you know I, I won't go into detail on those because I can't do it justice in you know the time we have available. But suffice to say, when we picked the DSI, there were three other very compelling options that we were looking at. Uh, which we would love to prioritise and sort of have uh, developed in the near future as well. And there will no doubt be other future use cases that come out in a machine learning space as well as we start to play with the data sets and, and just sort of see what comes out of it. Um, we have certainly identified that, you know, some other features that would be advantageous on this platform would be you know, works planning and, and tracking, um, you know, functionality, which could include things like spitting out automated, um, you know, runs for your crews to go and, and work on, even trying to assign uh, likely time, um, you know, periods of time to do those activities, costs as well, uh, you know, whether you need traffic control or not, we can sort of have that that functionality built in. Uh, and obviously the, the the big linkage is there, you know, as Nick said, we are looking mainly just at routine maintenance activities, but there's clear linkages to some of these other, uh, you know, longer term asset management planning activities as well that you could leverage out of this platform. So we haven't sort of gone too far down that road because, we're conscious that there's um, quite a few people who are already operating there. We don't want to be sort of stepping on anyone's toes, but there is some obvious synergies to, um, uh, yeah, for those sort of activities as well. Um, certainly our aim, and I guess I might just expand on that, that thought a little bit. We don't want to be seen to be competing with other commercial providers that are out there. However, we want to build in a basic level of functionality for any council um, to be able to do some of these activities and to improve their maturity in terms of, asset management, uh, routine maintenance and, and things like that. So I would almost see asset AI as the, as the base case, you know, it gives you some some limited but good functionality in those areas. And then if you want to go to a, a, a higher bespoke model through a commercial provider, then you can go and do that as well. So it gives people flexibility um, either way. Um, just in, just in regards to the expression of interest, so we've had 48 councils across New South Wales uh, express interest, and that list is growing all the time. Um, we've had quite a few in-depth conversations, nine who have signed MOUs, and I think a few others who are looking at potentially signing MOUs as well. Uh, I mentioned the transport teams that are involved. Uh, we have some interest from, from utility providers, particularly in the water space. Um, Sydney Water have sort of got wind of this, and they're looking at, you know, can we use our data to help them manage their, 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 their pits in particular, you know, the surface level uh, assets that they might have as well. So we think that's a, a good you know, partnership that we could explore as well. Uh, and we've obviously got interest from other states or, or representatives from other states as well. There's a very active group in Southeast Queensland who've heard of us and we've, we've had a few conversations with them. Uh, TMR is interested as well as are some people in Victoria. So I alluded to the fact that we think this will probably eventually scale outside of New South Wales uh, and there's certainly um, interest and demand for it to do that as well. So look, um, that's probably enough for today. I'm conscious that... Um, uh, Josh, there's two more questions in the chat too. Oh, sure. Okay, well, let's, let's jump into those. We're up to the questions now, so that's very good yep. time. <laughs> Uh, so one from Tim, does the AI platform have capacity to allow participating councils to add their subsurface data as a layer to allow machine learning algorithms to incorporate a cost component? Um, short answer, Tim, is not at the moment. I mean, councils can obviously bring in their own data and, you know, I think Nick showed that you can bring in your layers to the GIS and, and sort of things like that. But we haven't factored in subsurface conditions at the moment. Um, it's something that we're, we're keen to explore. But um, given sort of where our 
priorities are at the moment, it's probably not in the immediate future, would be my thinking. Nick, did you want to add to that at all? Uh, definitely. The We definitely looked at it a fairly robust conversation with our development team from a machine learning perspective. And I thought it was going to be fantastic. You know, council that's got a bit of data, we can share that um, and help the model. But where it'll break the model is when it's not applicable to the rest of the, the uh, state network. So there's a potential in the future that we'll be able to start building um, versions of the model uh, for a different council on the count, it'll be able to learn the council specific elements. But at this stage, the first generation will be just what data set we can get across the state. So there's some really nice data sets there that tease me because they're too small. Um, but definitely want to stay in contact with those data sets and, um, and see how we can integrate those in the future. Yep. And the speed of this stuff, I think that's not that far away. Yeah. <laughs> Um, there was another one in the chat there for, about the uh, use of uh, transport for New South Wales M3 specifications on state roads is fine, but uh, may not be for local roads. Um, very valid point. The M3 specification was, was the base document that was used to help start the process for the, inter, uh, the intervention responses, but it scaled on severity and road hierarchy. So what we're specifying on a local road is not the same response time on a state road. It'll be a longer duration. So we've taken that into consideration. Yep. Thanks, Nick. Uh, there's been another question from Bill. Um, oh, thank you for the, for the feedback, Bill. Uh, does the plan foresee a set of discrete maintenance specifications for work teams to follow aligned directly to each defect type in the asset AI toolkit and could chat GPT help in this regard? Uh, look, it's certainly certainly something that we've we've chatted about, um, and I think that feeds into that works planning type module that we've identified as something that we want to explore in the future. It's it's not on the radar at the moment, just because the focus is really on building up these machine learning models, and they do take a lot of time and resources. But we sort of see that you know that is that is probably one of the next priorities. Nick and I are being guided very much by the users as to where the priorities are for the next stage of development. And that's both the users at a council side, but will also increasingly be the users at a transport side. So there's a sort of a need to balance, um, you know, these competing demands. Everyone's trying to pull us in different directions. And we're sort of saying, well, hang on, let's just all agree. This is the priority and let's, let's push there. Short of someone giving me an open check to develop all these things in tandem. Um, we just don't have the resources to be able to do everything. Yeah. But, but Bill, I will give you one teaser that um, Deloitte are very keen to use chat GPT type technology, um, just like your good self. And they are working on a prototype of a chatbot that talks directly to Asset AI. Um, and I'm keen to get it off the ground. We just need to find the funding to, uh, to make it happen. But um, that'll be future conversations about whether that is something that can be adapted to councils, um, but definitely looking at that sort of technology. Yeah. Um, and there's a question here from Tim. Do you know the cost of the subscription service will be for councils? Uh, Tim, the short answer is no, but we are developing uh, the longer term business case at the moment. So we're hopeful to have a sort of a draft version of that by about September with the final um, version being approved sort of towards the end of the year so that will consider things like you know the resourcing costs and and you know the likely subscription costs that will flow through to to the councils um you know what i would say is we're, we're trying to make this obviously as as affordable as possible i mean you know we're a not-for-profit transport's obviously uh, not there to, to make a screen box of this as well but we need to make sure we can cover the costs both from a, uh, an operational perspective but also from a development perspective and the latter one's probably a bit, you know, a bit nebulous. As I said earlier, you know, we could spend as much money as we want, but we need to obviously do that in a sustainable way. So um, we'll have some more information about that uh, later in the year. Um, question from Paul, will local response times vary on defects severity, e.g. longer times for small defects and shorter times for larger potholes? Um, yes, yes, in short. So there is some, um, yep. you know, there's some flexibility in that. And that's that's what Nick was alluding to with that sort of algorithm at the, at the back about, you know, where it is on the network and um, the severity rating and the response times. 
Uh, we've identified that the response times, you know, we've obviously put some arbitrary values in there, but you know, we're getting feedback that there's probably a need to vary those on a council by council basis. So, um, you know, we want to standardise as much as possible, but also allow flexibility for for people to adjust it based on the service level agreements they have with their communities. Um, and then the last, oh, and then Danny, do you think there'll be two versions, one for state roads and one for local roads? Um, no. Never, not not as long as I'm here. Um, I don't want to build two different things for two different people because then it would become three and four and five. And you know, we need to build one platform. We're trying to standardise here, uh, keep everyone on the same system. Just allows that data sharing. If you have two separate offerings, then you lose that functionality. And I think that'd be a, a huge yep. loss if we down that road. I think that's all our questions. Yeah, I think it is. All right. Well, look, we might wrap it up there. Thank you, everyone, for coming uh, and for, you know, putting uh, or taking an hour out of your day, out of your lunchtime. Um, as I said... Do you want to get in contact with us? Yeah, sorry. I do have one more slide here. Thank you, Nick. I'll click through. So if you do want some more information, uh, please either email us or go to um, the Transport for New South Wales hosted website, or you can just email us through uh, IPW, EA, or the Roads and Transport Directorate. Um, we're very happy to um, you know, hear from people who want to have a bit more of a chat about this. And we've certainly had a lot of um, a lot of interest thus far. Um, as I mentioned, this is the first of our monthly webinar series. So we'll be having uh, one next month. We're just waiting to hear back from our hopeful presenter on that, waiting for confirmation from them. So look out for uh, details in the near future as to when that uh, webinar will be on. And uh, thank you all for coming today and for your attention. Thank you, everyone.